by the time I got this situation under control in Camp Mutiny, I called it, it was apparent that if I didn't stay there, they'd got the, 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 these ex groups had got confidence in me at that stage, and I couldn't just leave. Um, I was responsible for feeding them and uh, and looking after the, them and making sure that they didn't uh, uh, desert and, and start uh, shooting up farms, farmsteads and, and, and the likes of that. So I let the SAS know and that's when I found out that they didn't know. But um, I got support from them. Um, and I stayed with, with these gooks for another three and a half months. We lived and deployed together uh, in a similar fashion that I've spoken to you about just now. Um, we were very successful. Uh, Zipra started to to change their tactics. They they became nervous about sleeping in the same place at night, uh, for for more than one night. And that achieved our objective. The objective was uh, to separate the insurgents from from the population. That was that's the first phase in counterinsurgency uh, operations. And we could do that only because of the information that we were getting was so accurate. It, it just worked like a dream. So we were staging operations from the farm. And so every morning we were gone. So Zipra didn't know who to fight or where we were, which of course created a problem for them. Um, the second phase came when I trained these, uh, these uh, ex gooks or auxiliaries well enough so that we could re deploy them to their villages to go and look after their own people. And by that time they were a disciplined and united uh, unit and I had no problem with, with them deserting or, or getting up to shenanigans that they, they shouldn't have got involved with. And they started to have success. And um, that's when we relied upon them to do their own bit of intelligence. Uh, now, that was performed in this manner. The herd boys, because they, they were a population of peasant farmers, the herd boys were, were young, young kids aged from about five to 10, 11, 12, something like that. <clears throat> and the terrorists made them perform surveillance duties. They would be the first to, uh, tribes folk to see security forces patrolling through the bush. And they, the job of the herds boy, who we, we called Mujibas, he, his, his job was to go to, the, to meet the uh, link man. He was a terrorist who was dressed in civilian clothes and he would be stationed at a, a store or a church or uh, some dipping place and he would be the link between the population and the terrorist gang that would be located somewhere in the bush. He would know where they were located and when he got information he would run away and, and go and tell the terrorists where the security forces were or whatever else was going on and this terrorist gang would would respond uh, and turn up virtually the same night. So Martin, who was my right hand man, he Martin was very educated. Uh, he was educated in a, in a, a rural tribe and tribal school but he was bright. He didn't even have an accent when he spoke and he, he was an honorable fellow. He actually didn't want to become a terrorist but he was forced to do so as, as many of them were. Uh, and I met him at Camp Mutiny. He was one of the five that came up to me when I was standing on the boulder. 
and uh, because he was fluent and he could understand me well, I used him as the interpreter and actually he had leadership qualities, exceptional leadership qualities. So I used him to, as, as one of the, the senior personnel. Um, and Martin managed to get the local population to point out who the linked men were. And so we, I went to the chief and I said to him, look, it's difficult for us to approach a linked man carrying, when we're carrying an AK, because he can see you coming from miles off and he, he's going to react. I said, I need revolvers. So the chief organized me five revolvers, they were Smith & Wesson 38 Specials. And what we did is we dressed our operatives in, in denims, in civilian kit. And we would go up to a link man. Let's, let's take a typical scenario. A link man would be standing on the veranda of a, of a store watching what was going on and waiting for some information to come to him. And he'd see somebody coming around the corner uh, toward him, maybe holding a wallet. Now, we knew that a wallet would interest him. And when the operative would put the wallet in his pocket, he didn't think, he was, he was still approaching the link man. Now, the link man wouldn't think anything peculiar about that, ex except when, when he found out he was looking into a 38 special that went off and disposed a chunk of lead into his chest. Um, th that's how we took the link man out. On other occasions, we got a, a young female to walk past the, the link man and bend down. We knew his, what his, where his eyes would be. And the, the nearest fellow to him would pull out a 38 special and just take him out. So we, we started to take out the link men. Now, the link men also were the uh, in, intelligence uh, conveyors for incoming gangs of terrorists. And they would tell the terrorists where to go, which villages to go to, where they would get sympathy or where they could occupy uh, the, the village for a period, a short period of time before moving on. And by taking the link men out, we, we actually disrupted all their communication systems. So the next thing is we had bands of men wandering around, not knowing where to go and being caught up by, by the rest of us there. All part of the strategy to find the missile gang, because my re reasoning was, all these hundred had come from the Urungwi where the Viscounts had been brought down, and if the locals could point out who the link men were and, and and other terrorists, they could also point out who uh, were uh, were the Viscount gang. 